Welcome back. This session is going to be great, so I want to get right to it. For those of you struggling with the CMMC, wondering how to get things over the finish line, or even wondering where to start, this session is for you. Let's jump right into this distinguished panel of experts, which includes Andy Schumann. He's CyberSheath's COO and leader of CyberSheath's IT managed services business. One of the things I love about having Andy on this panel is the fact that so many of the requirements that are within CMMC are specific to information technology, and so rarely do we hear from the IT side of the house and their role in CMMC. Today's panel is going to pull that all together for you. So let's get right to it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me for this final uh, panel on what's been a tremendous event, CMMC Con 2020. Uh, I'm very pleased to have with me uh, a very distinguished panel who frankly lives in the trenches on a day-to-day -day basis. The point of this panel really is to cover three things. I want to I explain the fact that um, compliance is hard, right? And you, you, you need really three things. You need the IT expertise, you need the cybersecurity expertise, and you need the policy expertise. And you got to put them all together so that you can do it efficiently and at scale, and that's not easy. So the takeaway of this panel, uh, if we do our job right today, really is for everyone to come away with understanding the how of uh, attaining CMMC compliance or even uh, NIST 800-171 compliance. And so to do that, I've got, as I mentioned, a very distinguished panel. I have Andy Schumann, Chief Operating Officer for Cybersheet Services International. Andy has a long and distinguished career uh, on the IT side of the house, primarily, frankly, delivering IT at enterprise scale. And in my experience with customers, uh, both our customers and then also just being in this industry, so much of the focus is on cybersecurity and we rarely hear from the IT side of the house where, where a lot of the work actually gets done, right? Uh, I also have Carl Herberger, Vice President of Security Services at Cybersheet Services International. Carl also has a, a long career, both on the product side, on the services side, and then, frankly, in the trenches as a CISO, having worked at uh, many enterprises over the course of his career. So we understand what it's like, uh, you know, and, and we're, frankly, the reality of compliance meets uh, the reality of budget constraints and all the other things that, that uh, we're all straddled with. And then finally, uh, Casey Lang, Vice President of Compliance and Assessment. Casey, um, I don't think there's probably an environment he hasn't seen assessed remediated and made compliant, right? So from manufacturers to uh, software and development, research and development organizations, um, he's seen and done it all. He is a, a wealth of knowledge. And I think one of the things that you'll hear from Casey is he really understands the practical reality of compliance and, and how bringing IT and cybersecurity and policy together to actually make progress. So Welcome everyone, very excited about this final panel of CMMC Con 2020, because I think it's gonna give you a lot of value uh, for those small and mid-sized businesses struggling with where to start in achieving NIST 800-171 or CMMC compliance. So these guys are on the front lines every day, so let's get right to it. So, um, you know, we try and break, at CyberSheath, we try and break this problem of CMMC compliance down into achievable pieces, right? And for us, that means aim. You've seen it everywhere throughout this conference, assess, implement, manage, right? Break it up into those three workloads. And so we're gonna start this panel with assessment, right? And Casey Lang, let me ask you, start with you. Why is assessment so foundational to the success in achieving 800-171 or CMMC compliance, Casey? Yes, thanks, Eric. So assessments are foundational because it, it gives you the the roadmap to uh, to compliance. So when you're when you're when you're starting off, it's it's fair to make assumptions about your your environment, but the assessment process is really what's going to give you the granularity around how you're um, how you're currently implementing your controls and what your gaps are. Um, through that process will lead to kind of your, your approach to executing to get, it, get to a state of compliance. Um, and that uh, essentially is going to define how you, you lead to the implement phase um, of, this, uh, of this kind of workflow. Um, so in the process, there's really uh, a few key components that you're going to be looking at, um, especially with CMMC and the difference of CMMC 
um, to NIST Under 171 in the past, which is, um, do you have policy governing um, the implementation of requirements? Do you have documented practices? And then how are you actually implementing it? And are you implementing in a defensible way? Um, the defensible evidence-based assessment process is really key because you want to have factual knowledge about um, how you are implementing to come to that conclusion as to uh, being in a state of compliance. And if you can't defensively uh, argue that um, you are in a state of compliance, um, you're going to need to get to that point when it comes to the certification processes that are that are unfolding before us because um, they are evidence-based assessments. And the expectation is you, you can prove defensively that um, you um, that you are in that compliance state. So, so talk about that a minute, Casey. So, so when you, you talk about evidence and you're talking about proving compliance, so what are the kinds of things that prove compliance during an assessment? Because what I, one of the things I want people to understand is it's hard to do a self-assessment, right? Because uh, you tend to probably give yourself a little bit higher grade than maybe a third party would be. So if I'm assessing myself and I'm doing a self-assessment, how can I, uh, you know, offset any biases I might have? What kind of evidence might I look for during an assessment? Yeah, sure. So um, there's really kind of two types of controls, if you were to categorize them. There's administrative controls, where it's it's a process, it's a procedure, you follow it. In that case, you're looking for evidence that you're following that procedure. So if you're defining how you're doing something in a practice or a standard, um, the evidence is the proof that you are actually doing it. And the example I give is um, change management records. If you're claiming to do an ITIL-based change management process and you have an authorization boundary managed by firewalls, um, if you're doing ITIL-based change management, there should be a change record for your, um, for your firewall um, when you're making changes to your flow controls. Um, on the other hand, um, when it comes to technical configurations, um, uh, at its most basic antivirus, um, you can claim that you have antivirus by policy. Maybe you have a standard that says you install antivirus on your, on your endpoints. But where the rubber meets the road and where, where evidence comes into play is show me that you have an antivirus installed. And that's usually more than, okay, uh, turn on one computer, show me antivirus. You need something more than that. You wanna get a, a reflective evidence for your entire environment. So maybe you take a, uh, an inventory of your environment and compare that to the management console of your, uh, of your antivirus or endpoint solution and get a sense of, okay, this is really truly deployed across the in-scope environment. Yeah, so, so when I hear some of those things, Casey, one, that tells me uh, these these assessments, this is hard stuff. I mean, those are some great points there. But when I hear you talk about things like change management, um, I look to Andy Schumann and, and that's that's typically an IT function. When I think of change management, that's, that's in the IT job jar. And I think one of the things we've seen over the years, Andy, is that a lot of this compliance stuff around CMMC and NIST 800-171 is actually owned by the IT organization. So. How much of it actually ends up being in the IT job jar, and, and how do we um, how do we take advantage of what's happening in IT to help feed it into the assessment and compliance ultimately? Oh, thanks, Eric. Great question, and and you know it's, it's interesting listening to Casey talk and, and and listening to your questions. I mean, I think the one thing I'd say through our experience, certainly in the last ten years of my career, is that to do IT security cybersecurity and, uh, and, and be compliant, it's a team sport. And I, and I think the biggest thing that, that I've noticed over time and something at CyberSheath where we think we have a compelling uh, difference and advantage is by making it a team sport and having a very close relationship between cybersecurity and IT operations, uh, we've, that's where we see the most effective uh, um, uh, assessments and, and operations and indeed, um, I think that the, the biggest thing that I would say is that as we're talking to companies, what we see is we see an answer in the assessment from a, an IT security standpoint, and then we'll have a similar discussion with the IT operations group, and we'll get a subtly different answer. And, and, I, and I think the reason for that is that all too often uh, as we go into operations, we see stovepipes between IT security and IT operations. And the one thing that's very, very clear is while compliance is of utmost importance, the only way compliance can be effective is if both of the teams are in uh, conjunction with each other. And, and Case is absolutely right. The basis of good compliance is all around IT service management, 
ITIL is the, the fundamental building blocks of everything that we have to do for compliance. And so ensuring that there's a close proximity between IT security and IT operations is fundamental to an effective operation. And so what I would say the biggest thing to start thinking about as you're moving into an assessment and then indeed into the implementation and then management thereof is that you have that close alignment between uh, IT operations and IT uh, security so that uh, there is a one a one path for everything that we do. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are some great points. One of the things that I think is so important, don't hear about it enough, is the fact that CMMC is a maturity model. So it's not a compliance checklist, it's truly a maturity model. And so the things like ITIL and ISO and, and other frameworks, you know, are actually that produce frankly a lot of documentation, some of its policy, some of its process. Those things are critically important because that you're gonna need those to be able to show the maturity. This isn't a one and done assessment and, uh, and, and one and done compliance model. And so, you know, when I have that assessment, right, and I'll tell a short story here about uh, about Carl. Uh, so the way I met Carl, frankly, 12 years ago, I was a global CISO for a, a large uh, prime uh, in the defense industry. And frankly, I recognized the need. This was well before CMMC. I recognized the need to bring in a third party and do an assessment because doing a self-assessment, I could see everybody had other stuff on their plate. And if we did it ourselves, we probably weren't going to be as uh, rigorously honest as we could uh, simply because time, right? Just want to get it off my plate. Yeah, we're doing patch management. We're doing this. And so I brought in Carl's company at the time, you know, 12 years ago to get that third party view. And many times bringing in a third party to say things that and document things that you may already know to be true becomes a burning platform for companies. So Carl, when you get there, right? So when when uh, I've got my assessment, how, how do I use that assessment? What kind of outcomes can I drive with the assessment? You know, thank you for that, Eric and uh, <clears throat> Andy and Casey. The, the assessment's really critical, right? It's the way in which you go about figuring out how you meet the customer and the customer meets you on developing the capability to actually have a managed service, right? So I'm responsible, I think, as, you, as we've talked through this, the, the managed security piece on top of our service portfolio. Uh, and that managed security piece to me is a lot like uh, back in the days when Dr. Rob Spaulding and I flew together, uh, B-52s at Minot Air Force Base. It was about dashboard management, cockpit management. <clears throat> it means that you need to understand what part of your dashboards are relevant for the phase of flight and what colors those dashboard lights need to be uh, lit at. So uh, at CyberSheath, what we've done and we've been lauded about is uh, we've recently won a wonderful award by CIO Review Magazine as being the most outstanding partner in, in CMMC managed services. And they cited uh, three or four elements, which I'll share with you here today, which I believe is critical in vendor selection, but just in simply managing uh, this process going forward, the security process of this going forward. First is to understand uh, where you are. Are you CMMC level one, level two, level three? You know, today I believe we're the first uh, company to offer a varied managed service offering specific to the CMMC level. I'm not sure if that's still the case today. I think it might still be. Uh, so that's very important. Do you have 17 pieces of controls that you're trying to look at? 110, something more, 130, 170. <clears> Though <throat> Each one of those represents dashboard lights. Uh, the second is, is to make sure we understand how we work together. After all, we are integrating into your portfolio, your company. And you may already bring to the table investments, both in people and processes and technology that you like, you adore. Uh, that you want, that frankly, that you, maybe you need to uh, keep because of the investment capitalization strategy that you historically had made that investment on. That ability to actually keep that investment that you like, want, or need, and actually weave it into the dashboard is another key element to this. We, called our, we call this our shared security compliance framework, where we actually integrate what is our role, what is your role, uh, in the managed service uh, for both the compliance, the managed security, and also for the IT. 
And that's so the, important. That's, that's actually a great point because uh, regardless of who you're using, whether you have internal IT, a third party IT, you know, many times we, we have customers who they've got an IT service provider, they've got a security service provider, and then they have some form of internal uh, function as well. And, and one of the challenges is who's doing what to whom? All of yeah. that gets sorted out during an assessment. So I think it's, uh, you know, the point Carl's making about this, this dashboard, I mean, that, that's kind of the end state goal, right? Uh, but you can't get there without starting on your assessment. And the, the, the last thing I want to kind of hit on assessments here is that I, I think um, a mistake that we see sometimes is security will do the assessment or IT will do the assessment and it stays within security and IT. So it's briefed into the IT leadership and it, it needs to see the light of the day. It needs to be exposed to the rest of your organization because Carl, um, you know, CMMC impacts contracts, procurement, um, you know, it's basically, you've called it your hunting license with DOD. So it's pretty important that you get the executives of your, uh, of your organization up to speed on where you are with this compliance requirement, right? You know, we heard from Katie Arrington earlier today, right, that um, she's serious about having this defense industrial base become super serious and making it an endemic piece of the culture and the habit of a company that they understand that the role that they play in the nation's defense and the role that they play in the nation's vulnerability infrastructure too. So uh, yes, it needs to be part of that. And uh, as we all know here on this call, we've been through the registered provider program for CMMC. We know that CMMC is going to investigate things that are not that are atypical for uh, uh, essentially um, modern day standards. Things like uh, talking to your finance people about where the budgets lie and whether or not it's secured for future investments in the company, talking through your HR programs and understanding where you're doing on awareness and training and so forth, and also how the investments work and how have they historically been and how will they go going forward and so forth. So these pieces are, are absolutely critical going forward. This notion that you need to pre-qualify before you can get contracts going forward is going to be a mental model shift for most companies. Whereas I think in the past, they believed that they always had time, time to wait for the essentially the HIPAA police or the PCI police or fill in the blank compliance police to come, judge them as being maybe perhaps non-compliant, and then they would have time to be able to solve this. CMMC changes all of that, that you need to be in advance, pre-qualified as having been compliant before you can run uh, your revenue going forward. Yeah, and so, so Casey, you know, picking up on that assessment conversation and transitioning, right? Uh, I'm done my assessment. I, I did the things you, that you counseled me to do in terms of collecting evidence. I made sure that I briefed my executives and they were aware so that they could see the outcome and get a sense of uh, the investment required. I made sure, as Andy said, that IT was involved. I did a great assessment, but one of the things that uh, I don't hear talked about a lot, I'd love to hear your thoughts, is when in that process do I, do I write my system security plan and my plan of action milestones? I wait till I'm done my assessment, is it in parallel? Where's that fall into the mix? Because it's required. Yeah, I would say that it's in parallel uh, for the most part, because the, the difference between assessment language and system security plan planning language is that the SSP is really your security narrative. It's your it's your feel good security story. Um, I've seen it done both ways where some customers will capture plan of action milestone data within their system security plan and, and track uh, within there where deficiencies are. But um, in most cases, it's it's uh, two separate documents. The system security plan being the security narrative, you might mention where your deficiencies are in that plan um, if you have deficiencies. And then the plan of action milestone is really tied to um, you, your compliance deficiencies. So if, if you're compliant on any given control requirement, your plan of action uh, and milestone language should be tied to that. What actually needs to get uh, accomplished to meet the intent of that control requirement. So um, I've seen kind of the spectrum of POAMs being kind of regurgitated um, control requirement language, but that doesn't really describe how you're, uh, how you're getting to a compliant state. Um, I think the preference from my standpoint and what we try to deliver is um, plan of action milestones that are more actionable and less um, less obscure where there's kind of uh, subjectivity around the interpretation. Um, but yeah, in in parallel, 
I would say. Um, as soon as you're, you're at that point, you have an assessment report, um, you'll have the material that you need to at least start a system security plan and then uh, get rolling on that plan of action milestone. And then obviously, av- as you're tracking that plan, you're updating your system security plan to reflect your state of compliance. So if, if you're making changes that are bringing you to closer to a cl- compliant state, you want to maintain that security narrative. Um, in the past, I think system security plans are, are typically the go-to thing to ask for when it comes to um, where you're at with your security. It tells you how um, how you're accomplishing the control requirements. Um, and that's um, that's really kind of your, almost your security marketing material from a defense contractor standpoint to um, explain what you really do for security and how you do it. Yeah, it really is kind of the visual representation or the documented representation of how you're meeting the system security plan is, is the documentation of how you're meeting all the control requirements. And, you know, the other thing that I'll, I'll just uh, bring back to assessments for one second, you're talking about SSP and POEMS. A- another challenge, Andy, right? So a lot, many times uh, you'd see um, sometimes security reports into IT, right? It's all, it's all over the map, depending on the organization, but that means the budget's in IT. So a mistake we've seen many times is Hey, we're going to go do an assessment ourselves. We may even contract the third party ourselves, right? And it's just all kept within security. And then out comes this assessment and these POEMs that say, we got to get multi-factor authentication. We need whole disk encryption. We need to go from E1 to E3. And it's this laundry list of cost that then they go hit IT with. And, and, and IT wasn't brought in, wasn't part of kind of the, the executive stakeholder process and didn't get this slow build up to say, okay, we know something's coming. So Andy, oftentimes, you know, we see many customers at 70% or more non-compliance. You've had tons of experience on the IT side, bringing them from 70% non-compliance all the way up to 100% compliance. But with that laundry list of POEMs and sometimes, frankly, a surprise cost that you weren't budgeting for, where do you start on the IT side of the house? Um, So another great question, Eric. And it's, in fact, this is kind of a, a religious discussion that KC and I have uh, very often coming out an assessment into how do I work implementation to really address the non-compliance. And, uh, and what I'd say is that I think the biggest mistake that I've seen made is that I have an SSP and I have 18 poems associated with it. I try and jump and address all 18 at once. And that, that can have uh, disastrous uh, outcomes because, you know, really what, uh, my, my playbook in this, I think, is very, very simple, is to start with fundamental building blocks. So if you think about the IT environment and where we're at, it's very typical that we will see, hey, there's issues around vulnerability management, there's issues around endpoint protection, I might need to implement multi-factor authentication. And I could easily see myself doing 18 different projects, even if the budget allowed, and I had the budget, But then I have to think about how does that impact my infrastructure? How does that impact um, all of our end users? And what does that really mean to the operation of IT? So, you know, in essence, Eric, my my view of the world is very simple. I start with the very basic building blocks. And so I would look at it, and I look at this fairly logically and say, let me start with the endpoint. Do I have good endpoint protection? If I don't, fundamentally that's where I want to go. I want to implement endpoint protection. I want to make sure it's effective. Once I have that endpoint protection, I'll start thinking about vulnerability management. Vulnerability management, do I have a capability to identify where my vulnerabilities exist? If I don't, then let me start working on that. Then once I have an effective vulnerability management process, that identifies where I need to to go after patching. And so, In essence, what I'd say without going through every single step of an implementation is that start with the basic building blocks. And those basic building blocks, one, will have a massive effect in their impact towards gaining greater compliance, but two, will ensure that as we implement these changes and infuse these changes, that we don't fundamentally break our environment. So I think, in essence, what I'd say is so, but you focus on the building blocks. The building blocks will have a major impact to how we're compliant. And then following on from those, we can start implementing some of the more sophisticated things that potentially have greater disruption. That may be around um, uh, sophisticated monitoring as we move forward, definitely multi-factor authentication 
And then even cloud-based security as we start moving further afield. But I, I think the message I would leave is start with the basic building blocks, Harry, because I think that's fundamental to doing this well. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there, right? And I think uh, it, it's a unique perspective, not, not here at CyberSheet, but I think in general, right? So much of this stuff is security, security, security. And, uh, you know, frankly, it's it's been a good decade to be in security, right? Security tends to be well-funded. They're the ones pointing out the challenges. They're the ones kind of on the front lines, but they get, a, you know, significant amount of credit. And I, I empathize with the IT side of the house who has to worry about licensing, budget, competing priorities. Security has those things too, but, but on the IT side, some of the things Andy mentioned, you know, all of those decisions around the endpoint, around servers and vulnerability management have cascading sets of consequences around, well, but our license doesn't allow for that. Well, we have a tool, but it's only for this part of the business. And well, that was unbudgeted. And, and so there's a lot of things, and that's why I started off saying, it's an IT security and this policy convergence, and you need all of that expertise. Um, and it's very hard to have all of that in house. And then you have that expertise, then you got to start thinking about contracts and licensing. And so, and then there's a bunch of technical decisions to make along the way. So, as you're going through implementation, um, you know, I wanted to ask Carl, our customers and, and the industry in general, right? Uh, no two companies look the same. Some are 100% on-prem, some are on-prem and cloud, some are, some are just endpoints. And uh, I mean, there's, there's everything in between. So how do you help make some of those technology decisions that, uh, you know, and what's kind of a framework for doing that, knowing that everybody's in a, coming from a different place? Yeah, Eric, this is a great point, is uh, companies are in different places in their journey of IT operations and how they service their business. Uh, we all know this, that whether, whether it be premise-based uh, IT management and application delivery, all the way to cloud or hybrid approach or a multi-cloud approach, or actually where you're actually federating a whole bunch of software as a service in a combination of all of those things. Uh, all of that is achievable to be managed. As you know, we actually have this whole philosophy of meeting you where you are and being able to take you in your journey. The key in managing your compliance for the div is really getting a hold and handle of what kind of data is concerning to the government. We all are familiar by now, the CUI requirement and the federal contracting information requirement and the various different forms of those things. The truth is, as we know here at CyberSheath, and I think many other companies are beginning to realize, the, the more, the smarter approach from a cost effective approach is to get a handle of where you run that CUI. It's easy to say if you can't, that everything is in scope and, and therefore, ergo, we need to maintain every single place and every single operation as if it's handling CUI information. That's of course achievable, but it's also costly. If you can get an estate management or an enclave management, as you heard Richard Wakeman talk about in the Microsoft uh, section of this presentation, this estate management and enclave management is a, is a brilliant way to be able to both achieve what the government's looking for, limit the amount of exposure, also what the government is looking for and limit your cost and frankly, help your service provider help you in becoming smarter at being able to keep this kind of sensitive data at bay at, and also at reduced risk. So what I would suggest is that no matter where you are, if you're still legacy waterfall application premise-based delivery, uh, we can help you with that. And I think we know how to do this and that's a very straightforward uh, way of thinking about things. If you are next generation microservices, ephemeral uh, services, um, application development, leveraging nothing but APIs and software as a service, we also know how to do this and how to actually deal with CUI in that environment. So Eric, your point is very, very valid. It's um, how to orchestrate and choreograph. And I think the answer to that is twofold. Where do you want to be and how do we enclave management uh, your data for the government? Yeah, I think, I mean, great point. Frankly, we've seen the future and it's, it's enclaves in terms of lowering cost, lowering the attack surface or reducing it. Um, it is the solution. Now, sometimes you need someone to really help navigate there because there's a lot of IT decisions that go along with that. 
in terms of going from on-prem to a cloud-based enclave. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about implementation, right? So we went from assessment to implementation. And right now, Casey, everybody's focused on the November 30th deadline coming up here very shortly, about 12 days, and getting their assessment into SPRS, right? Um, supplier performance risk system. But I know from experience that implementation is the longest, most difficult, and most expensive phase of getting to, to CMMC compliance. So I can appreciate the, the need to get your assessment uploaded and getting that done, uh, but the hard work really is still ahead of you. So one, do you agree, Casey, that uh, you know implementation is kind of the, uh, the heavy lifting phase of this whole process? And what does that mean in terms of planning and the practical reality of, of getting through an implementation to get fully compliant? Yeah, implementation is is certainly the heaviest lift, and and it kind of resonates with the whole theme of this discussion around um, the the tight coupling of your your security, your compliance function with the IT function, because a lot of these changes are maybe led by IT because it's a compliance or led by security because it's a compliance deficiency, but um, executed by the IT function. Um, so if you take, for example. Um, Software management, uh, understanding your software inventory, not traditionally a security function, um, but a security requirement to understand that a software uh, a software inventory exists, uh, software whitelisting or blacklisting, heavy dependencies on the IT function to make that happen, and heavy dependencies on the IT function to help execute any plans related to uh, things in, in their uh, bucket of work, which happens to be a lot when it comes to these remediation projects. Um, with that said, I mean, I think from a timeline perspective, going from assessment through through managed services, um, implementation is probably the um, the biggest kind of component of the project. As long as you're you're considering the fact that when you get to the end of implementation, you're turning this over to an operational phase. That um, it, it is a uh, it, it's a continuous process, right? So. Um, there's continuous processes for you get your you get yourself to a compliant phase and you manage that compliance and then you also need to have your your processes in place to understand that you're staying in compliance. So regular assessments, continuous monitoring, things like that to keep things um, in that compliant state, self-assessed and self-correcting. Yeah, Casey. Uh, so I think what I heard you say is a lot of this is on Andy's plate in IT. <laughs> so, uh, so he's going to have a lot of work. Uh, but, but you know, you, you touched on some things that I think are very important to highlight here. So, one, um, there is no end state, right? So, one of the mistakes that we see sometimes is, all right, we're done. We got everything implemented. But there's a management phase to all this. But before we get into the the final, you know, assess, implement, manage. Before we get into management. One of the questions I get all the time, literally multiple times a day, uh, you know, a customer will call and say, uh, I have a company, how much and how long will it take me to get compliant? And it's like, oh, we need a little bit more information. Um, but it's a, it's a fair question and I understand it. And so Andy, I wanna talk a little bit about scoping because as uh, Casey said, you know, a lot of this is in the IT side. And one of the challenges sometimes is if the security people are leading the conversation, they don't necessarily have all the information that resides in the IT side of the house in terms of, yeah, how many virtual machines do we have? How many assets do we have? All that kind of day-to-day -day operational data that comes out of IT. Talk a little bit about scope, Andy, from an IT perspective. How do I start to get, you know, forget, forget the types of information, but how do I get my hands around the IT state from a scoping perspective? And, and, you know, Eric, that's a really perceptive question because, you know, when we think about it, and I'll, I'll, I'll head back for, for 20 seconds to assess, even in trying to, um, to scope out what it is we're looking to assess, well, there are fundamental pieces of information that we need. And so in time, back to that, this is really about the core, uh, core processes, uh, IT service management processes, this is around configuration management. It's around asset management. And it's about setting out your store to understand what does your enterprise look like. So in essence, as we try and figure out what it is we're looking for and what we're actually going to be included in scope, the first thing to start with is something very, very simple like, well, what hardware do I own? Do I have an asset inventory? To the point that Casey made earlier, what about software? I have to then link 
software to hardware to understand the relationship between the two of them. And, and, and I think so what you end up doing there is you end up having a great picture of your environment, which then allows you to scope where it is you need to go. What platforms do I have? Do I have Windows? Almost definitely. Is there Unix? Do I have Linux? And then being able to eloquently really shape what the enterprise looks like to make sure that when you do go and look at implementation, you have a plan of how I'm going to address the different platforms that I run. But I think the most important thing to note as we're working through what does scope look like is that one, no two customers are the same. And two, in order to really understand how effective and successful you can be, is to make sure you understand what do I have in my environment today. So asset management, whether it be software or hardware asset management, closely followed by configuration management and change management, those interrelationships really will help us, one, scope out what we need to go and assess. And then when we start thinking about the implementation piece, how do we segment what, we, what we're going to do? Because in essence, as, as you'd suggested and talked about, you know, we often see people at 70% non-compliancy. And that pretty much means that I have to touch every piece of their environment. So what it allows me to do if I have a good picture of what um, the environment looks like, the platforms look like, the hardware looks like, the software looks like, I can put together a plan of implementation. So as I do this methodically, I don't, one, interrupt the operation too much. Because the other thing I'd say as an IT operations guy, and we have this discussion all of the time, is that we don't often think about the person at the end of a computer who's trying to do their day-to-day job. So as we do think about compliance and implementing uh, any improvements that are required to gain that compliance, how do we effectively implement without impacting the very people that, that keep our business afloat? So it's, in, in my mind, it's all about asset management, configuration management, and change management. They're all intrinsically linked to basically ensuring that as you as you approach implementation, you do it in a very methodical manner and you understand the impact to your end user population. I think from my perspective, that critical to a successful implementation. Yeah, and so that, that scoping data, you know, Carl talked a little bit about scoping around the actual data, right? Is it FCI, is it CUI? Andy talked about the scoping of the infrastructure and the IT estate. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, we have almost a, a running conflict internally sometimes with our folks in the sales side and the folks in managed services, because, um, you know, a lot of times customers don't know the answers to these questions, right? Uh, so we have a very simple three-page scoping document that we use. We have a much more comprehensive 15-page one that Andy and his team would love uh, the sales team to use, because the more information, the better, right? But it's hard to get... Uh, companies to fully think about all this stuff that sometimes they don't know, they might not know. It, it's, it's forced a lot of um, re-examination of existing contracts. So when you start to, you know, I think our IT vendor does that. I think our IT security, our MSP is, is on the hook for that, but they actually have never done it. Um, so it forced a re-examination of some of those things as you start to think about the, the technical scope of what you have to manage. And frankly, that's why we ended up getting into the managed IT services because we're doing managed security services for many, many years, but we realized over time uh, and the best way I know to put it is our customers wanted one throat to choke. They didn't want an IT vendor and a security vendor uh, and have to, you know, have that argue, oh, that's in their scope, that's in their scope. So we eventually just acquiesced and, and gave our customers what they were asking for. And Carl, that goes into management, right? Because as you, you've done your assessment, you've done your implementation, you've achieved compliance, you're getting out, out of the com- implementation phase into manage, uh, managed compliance, whether you're doing it internally or you're hiring a third party, that coordination between IT and security has to really be somewhat of a performance art at that point because they, they need to stay in lockstep or you're going to fall out of compliance and all that good work you've done, uh, you know, you're going to regress, Carl. Yeah, you know, Eric, as you were talking, there was many things that came to mind um, whereby this DIB set of DFARS compliance really goes counterculture, right? Um, For, I would say, the better part of two decades, IT has gone in a mode to outsource and then to offshore. And uh, the offshoring was um, on many levels. 
Uh, sometimes it was H-1B employees that came to the United States that were less expensive, uh, and but they were getting an opportunity here. Sometimes it was actually the IT operations leaving the United States and going offshore so that you can gain some benefit in some cost reduction, uh, maybe, uh, maybe some local uh, worldwide global data centers uh, use, and also software maintenance development uh, uh, situations whereby you would have things like call centers for your TAC, your technical analysis centers, the ability to actually do break fix, uh, the ability to maintain your software was was often by many companies and still is today for the last two decades uh, the trend the 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 norm the predominant way in which you did IT fulfillment was in those three areas. Now come along DFARS, CMMC, and the increased requirements for data sovereignty and for um, supply chain security, and you kind of break that uh, the, that whole model and that you have to now look at things once again with a fresh new set of glasses that you have to look at things for the div for this customer the US De- defense department and your attributes of managing security and this is sort of the long answer to your question now has to be reintroduced again uh, do we have U.S. citizens with the proper background investigations, depending upon the data that they're working on, is the are the tools and the operating locations are they data sovereign? Are they sovereign in the U.S. for operations for the for CUI information? Uh, does the maintenance and the call center and analysis centers and the break fix and the vulnerability assessing and the response and the forensics and the capabilities for data backups? Do they all reside data sovereign? Because these are all part of the rule sets. So the, the answer to what I was thinking about as you're going through this, Eric, is you know this model needs to be tended to by breaking first the assumptions that you've used in the past and much of the many big companies' IT operations. And I think this is the way we've gone about it here at, at uh, CyberSheath was to give you a fresh new look. Now, th- the piece to this, I'm sure, if I was listening to myself talking, would be, well, that sounds expensive to me because, you know, the reason why we did all these things was to offshore was for mostly cost reduction purposes, or sometimes it was to gain access to talent. Um, the truth is, is that in today's world, if you can bring IT security and compliance management under one house and do that very, very well, you gain the efficiencies, no kidding, the efficiencies of scale, as well as the reduction of the friction between the siloed solutions. And this is what I think we're going to market with in a very powerful way uh, so that we can provide you at or above your normal quality levels and at or above your normal uh, compliance levels. That's how we're thinking about it, Eric. Yeah, and I think the the manage piece, right? Again, whether you do it internally or not, and, and I just be transparent, I, I think that Companies of a certain size, right? The big primes are going to do most of this in-house because they can. Uh, the majority of the supply chain isn't, right? You, you need help. You need a trusted advisor. And look, I was there. I was the CISO for the second largest global aerospace and defense company in the world. And this was a little while ago. And uh, security wasn't as well funded or as mature or, or as uh, publicly talked about it was today. So we had a pretty bare bones budget until some things changed and then we didn't. Um, so I understand what that looks like, but I also understand from the last decade of what the rest of the supply chain looks like, who isn't as well funded and frankly uh, needs help and, and needs third parties who can bring together the IT, the security and the policy expertise. And, and the big thing that I think is so important about bringing that together, it, it Carl uses an analogy frequently that um, you know, most of us don't do our own taxes. Probably almost none of us uh, give ourselves our own medical care, right? At, at some point, uh, it's not worth the cost savings for me to kind of Google my symptoms and, and home treat myself, right? There, there's a point where it gets serious enough that I'm gonna I'm gonna go get some qualified third-party expertise, right? And I think that's where we are within the Department of Defense with CMMC because. We're at the point where it's you can't do business with the Department of Defense if you don't meet these compliance requirements. So it's at the point where, okay, I'm beyond Googling kind of how to implement some of these controls. 
I need someone to own this and to manage this for me. So on the management side, you know, I'll go to Casey and then, and then Andy. Um, you know, again, I've got the uh, security and the, the IT functions, sometimes separate, sometimes together, but distinct. They do different things. On the management side, Casey, we'll start with you. Um, how, how Describe what good looks like in terms of security, being aligned with IT and working kind of hand in glove to meet these compliance requirements. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So uh, I would say good looks like um, active management of your security program. Um, now, there's kind of two angles. There's the the compliance management, which is kind of a it's a set of tasks, right? You want to do annual internal security assessments. You want to do um, annual risk assessments. You want to maintain your system security plan and your POAM. And again, back to that system security plan, there's the initial effort to get to compliance. But then there's the uh, the self-measurement and self-management of your environment from that compliance perspective endlessly. Um, so having those processes in place to uh, measure yourself, ensure that you're, um, you're scoring yourself appropriately, and then establishing or managing that plan of action milestone for any deficiencies to, uh, to have the ability to self-correct. And again, with that said, um, you know, you're, you're assessing the IT function in a lot of cases um, with regards to how technical controls are in place. Um, so having that that strong uh, coupling of of the IT and security function is is critical to um, to making that happen. And I think one of the most visible representations of that, Andy, is in the vulnerability uh, vulnerability management arena, because oftentimes the the tools to find the the vulnerabilities are run by security, and they'll tell you you have X number of vulnerabilities, and uh, okay, IT go patch it. And and I think. Uh, we've all seen poorly managed environments where there's a tremendous amount of friction between IT and security because security is kind of just piling on and IT didn't get any more resources to deal with the problem. So, Andy, the flip side of that, what's good look like from an IT perspective in, in a partnership with security? And I think the vulnerability management example is a good one. So I think, first of all, I'd echo what Casey said. I mean, honestly, uh, it's what I said in, in, in the introduction to this um, uh, when we talked about, you know, uh, what assessments look like is it's a team sport. Um, you know, going from large enterprises down to, to small businesses, you see the gambit from stovepipe to, uh, you know, one person managing all of it. And the reality is that it is a team sport. And, and I think what good looks like is – where I see IT security and IT operations working together to solve a problem. Uh, all, all too often what we see, and this is especially true in the larger enterprises, is almost IT security being a policing function, saying you must ask mother, may I? And IT operations being the, the, the hands and legs doing. And so I would say that what good looks like is when IT security are working hand in glove with IT operations to, to address the vulnerabilities. And, and you know, I, I'll give one example here. I know we've several have used examples throughout the discussion. Working at a very large global, uh, uh, global manufacturer in the defense sector, uh, I, I witnessed for about 12 to 18 months a new security plan being implemented across the company and IT security implementing new tools like more advanced uh, endpoint protection, more advanced patching tools, and in, in general, just more monitoring of the environment from vulnerability to continuous uh, infrastructure monitoring. And, and over time, what I've seen is uh, IT security on a monthly basis reporting uh, the, the number of growing vulnerabilities that the environment exists, and actually no communication at all between IT operations and security until a year later uh, when um, a new CIO came on board who had responsibility for both. And what was found was that there was about uh, 17 million vulnerabilities in the environment because IT security had been monitoring the environment, assuming IT operations were doing their stuff. Nobody was actually looking at the data. So good to me looks like very, very clearly um, the hand in glove approach that Casey talked about. And, and you know, from a compelling piece, Eric, I think the other thing I'd say is the best products we deliver as a service company are those that our customers ask us to, to, ask us to deliver. And I'll go back to some of that point that you made. 
which I, I think is the secret sauce moving forward, which is, you know, we've been driven by our customers to be that single throat to choke. And, and the ability to have the assessment, the implement and the manage done by a single third party is very compelling. And, and you know, to, to, to just to catch on a point that Carl talked about, actually, it isn't more expensive, even if you think about potentially things being offshore and with different providers, because typically when you have multiple internal and external providers, that drives a higher cost of integration anyway. So, you know, I mean, replaying back your own points, Eric, I think good looks like hand in glove and the best product we can offer. And I think our compelling difference is to be able to offer that for a single source. Yeah, I think, I think you know, having that site picture that kind of comes together of IT security and the policy stuff and being able to manage it over the long term, because Carl, as you know, uh, you know, we, many of us, actually, I think everybody probably on this particular uh, panel has been through the registered provider training, the RP training from the CMMCAB. Um, it's a three-year accreditation cycle, and you can't, it'd be like saying, well, I'm going to smoke, I'm going to drink, I'm not going to exercise, and I'm going to sit on the couch until my physical next year. And right before the physical, I'm going to get back in shape so that I pass. I mean, that, that'd be the equivalent of just kind of walking away from the assessment and implementation work and not doing the management. So it's important that you stay up with this stuff, Carl, on the management side. If for no other reason, then you've got another test coming up in three years and it, and it directly impacts your business if you haven't been on top of the manage piece. Yeah, I think that's a heart attack waiting to happen, that strategy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't imagine just getting it and doing a fitness test out of the blue. We all know that that's a super dangerous uh, methodology. Or the 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 other piece to it, I think there's a couple of pieces that people are not. Um, it's not altogether obvious to uh, in this de in this deployment of the DIB security model. First of all, if you have some sort of massive breach or you're involved in some sort of breach supply chain challenge, i.e., that maybe your prime was breached that could have affected you, or maybe your subs were uh, breached or, and, and so forth. And what's the likelihood of that over a three year period of time? I would argue probably at least medium, maybe high. Uh, and this may have you to have to revisit your whole security plan anyway. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, both a requirement and a consideration. And the, the other piece of it is as I kind of alluded to, is that your third-party providers in this whole process become both a, uh, a key element to your delivery, but also a liability. Let's be frank, All right? The more complexity you have in your third-party providing infrastructure, which they all have to be CMMC certified if you're under a CMMC contract, and if they're handling CUI, they also have to be NIST 800 certified, as we all know. Uh, so this is, a, I think, a missing element that we see in many of our customers is that this aha moment that their IT provider also has to be NIST 800 certified. That's the requirement. By the way, the DFARS law requires you to have a language specific in your outsourcing contracts for DIB customers to be actually integrated into those contracts for DFARS. And we know that many, many customers don't have them. So I guess what I'm trying to say in that answer to your question, Eric, is that you can't just wake up overnight and run that marathon and do that fitness test. It's an ongoing process of monitoring, managing, maintaining. And like we saw this year, the level of change in the amount of the compliance infrastructure has been enormous in and of itself. This idea that you set and you forget has to be removed. And going forward, it has to be put in place that it's a continuous process. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you said that because um, I wanted to make sure we covered that, right? So even if you've got the IT and the security piece in-house and you're kind of blessed with those resources, uh, the policy piece, right? I mean, you look at all the change in the last just over 18 months. We, we had the introduction of CMMC. We had a revision of CMMC. We had the DFARS. Uh, you know, interim rule come out. We had the SPRS upload your assessment requirement. We have, uh, you know, it, within the interim rule, we have two other DFARS requirements. I mean, just staying on top of the policy stuff uh, can be a, a full-time job. And then translating it uh, into actual actionable uh, 
tasks for the IT and the security team and coordinating that orchestra is in and of itself a full-time yeah, job. Yeah, Eric, I really think that this is turning into something like the IRS. You know, it's use where you, we've gotten used to the idea that the uh, tax codes can change and often do every single year, sometimes multiple times in a year, and that there are consequences to filing and so forth. Uh, we all know that. This DFARS acquisition cybersecurity world feels to me like it's going to be in a continuous state of upgrade and change. Uh, and this is a very important point in picking out your partners as you go forward, is that the partners stay on top of these changes for you. Yeah, you really, you really have to demand it. Um, you know, we, we obviously would love to be that partner for you, but, but regardless of what path you choose, uh, we appreciate your time today being here at CMMC Con 2020. I hope this panel, being our last panel of the day, was kind of the capstone uh, for those of you who attended. We had a huge turnout for this conference, so I, I hope that uh, those of you who are struggling came to the other end of this panel and said, I have some answers now. If you want to reach out to us and, and get some more specific answers to your situation, obviously we love having those conversations, but I want to thank everyone for their time today. It's uh, It's been well spent from our perspective. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Carl, Andy, Casey, thank you guys very much. Don't forget your book. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Pick up your copy of our book. That's Thanks, right. everyone. Bye-bye now. Wow. What a great session to close CMMCCon 2020. Thank you to all participants and to those of you watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. With that, I want to send it over to CyberSheath CEO, Eric Noonan, for closing remarks. Eric? Good afternoon. What a day. I hope everyone enjoyed today's event. It was an incredible session with Katie Arrington to kick off the day. I hope that was an informative format for you, something a little bit different than what you've seen before. Answer some questions that I know haven't been asked before. Boy, Rob Spaulding, I think General Spaulding, what he shared with us today, if you didn't understand the national security implications of this before, I hope you do now. And then of course the panel where we heard from Elbit Systems of America, CEO Renan Horowitz and others around how everybody with all these different perspectives is looking at the problem of CMMC compliance. I think that really helped inform some perspectives. And then hopefully you got to the panel at the end of the day where we talked about the how of CMMC compliance. If we did our job today at CyberSheath, you left here with some actionable ways to further yourself along in the compliance journey. Of course, don't forget, be on the lookout in the next two weeks. You're going to get a copy of our free ebook, CMMC Companion 2020 which is gonna give you everything you need to know about CMMC and NIST 800-171 compliance. So again, thank you for taking time out of your schedule today. I hope we hit the mark. If you have any more questions, please reach out to us at cybersheet.com and have a great rest of the day. Thanks again.